So as I said, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mark Hanson. I'm a deputy principal at a school in Queensland, um, but my previous role was as a master teacher of mathematics. And that's something that I've been very passionate about for a number of years. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. And thanks again to Gavin and Anusha for their work on education influence. Um, my role today is basically just to share with you some great maths activities, some games that I enjoy, that I feel make a difference, um, that also research has shown has made a difference. So we're going to get into those games fairly shortly, um, but to kick us off today, if you could just let us know, maybe in the chat box, your name, your location, and how you're feeling, how you're going. So it's called a one word barometer. So for myself personally, I'll type it in the chat box anyway, but my name is Mark. My role is a deputy and a dad. And um, my, my one word barometer at the moment is just humbled by this experience. So feel free to type in the, in the chat box your name, um, your role, whatever that may be, and how you're feeling at the moment. Thanks for joining us, Lydia. Thank you, Bina. Thanks, everyone. So this first little game is a nice, simple one. This one, we're going to get into some real problem-solving type activities soon. This one's more of a fluency type game. Um, and this one is based on, welcome to Misha. This one is based on the game uh, Paper, Scissors, Rock. So if you know that one, paper, scissors, rock, paper, scissors, rock, and you throw scissors or you throw um, paper or you throw a rock. But this one's still a two-person game, but it's working with numbers. So this game we just call one, two, three numbers. I've got my um, trusty friend here, my daughter Annabella, who's going to come and give us a hand. So let's see, um, let's see how we play one, two, three numbers. This is just a quick one just to get us started. So ready? Welcome, Annabella. How are you feeling? It's your one-word barometer. Um, you're excited all right let's go so one two three numbers three. three so we we throw some numbers with our fingers so we might throw a five a four a three a two a one or a zero and then what, what we do is we quickly um reconcile how many we've thrown how many fingers we've put up how many our friend or our colleague has put up and then we add those two together so like i said this is just a really quick easy fluency fun game We've got students at our school who even play it on the bus on the way home. No materials required. There's a lot of uh, research and a lot of power in the use of fingers in mathematics. So I remember when I went to school, it was thought that if you, you know, if you used your fingers, that was something to be ashamed of or something to be worried about. Um, and we're encouraged not to use our fingers. Whereas now there's so much research coming out about the power of fingers. Um, even if I was to ask you what's eight plus two, and we hooked you up to a brain uh, scan, it would actually light up the finger component of your brain. So even as adults, we're still looking at our fingers, we're still thinking about our fingers. Right, Annabella, we'll have a couple more goes. So come over here, Rosa. So one, two, three, numbers. Two, one, two, three, numbers. Five. Okay, thanks, Annabella. Let's give Annabella a cut. Good on you, Annabella. So that one's just a quick one called one, two, three, numbers. There's lots of different ways to play that one. You can start to do it with, with two with um, you know two hands. You can start to do it with whatever it might be. You can even look at difference. So for example, one person throws five fingers, the other one throws two. It's the quickest person to say three. So like I said, it's not so much a problem solving, really critical thinking type game. It's more of just a fluency type game that students have fun with. Um, for the senior school, you could even do times tables. So someone puts up a two, someone else puts up a three, or two times three is six. All right, so let's get into the other activities that we've got here today. What I'd like to do is just share with you a PowerPoint that I've put together. I'm assuming you can all see that at the moment. Okay, so that's just my title screen there. We've done that one. We've spoken about one, two, three numbers. So today, my job is basically just to share with you some games and activities that teachers, parents, and children can use. And we want to think about how we can use these activities with children of different ages, different experiences, and even different dispositions in mathematics. 
Again, dispossession is the attitude we have towards mathematics. And again, a lot of research coming out showing just how powerful that is. Um, I know in the Australian curriculum, we have, um, we have the proficiency strands, which we talk about affluency, understanding, problem solving and reasoning. But I know in Singapore um, and in many other countries, they have this fifth strand, um, which is the, the sort of the hidden curriculum of disposition. Basically the idea that if we don't enjoy mathematics, well, we're not gonna do well at it anyway. So we want students to encourage, or we wanna encourage students to enjoy mathematics, to love it. And that's part of what we looked at today. So when in this activity, this whole uh, presentation is called Great Maths Activities for All, what lens did I run over that? You know, uh, what sort of activities are you going to get today? Today, you're going to get some activities that are free, that require very little materials and that are fun to play. That's basically the lens. None of these or not many of these cost much money. Most of these can be done in any classroom. If you're a parent, you can do these at home. So it's just about trying to work on those dispositions um, with, with respect to mathematics. So background before we get into it, what is maths and what is numeracy? And is there a difference? I don't know if anyone would like to have a go in the chat box for that one. What is numeracy and what is mathematics? Shut this door. So basically, mathematics is the use of the numbers, or um, you know, the, the sort of, I guess the. Um, you know, the components of mathematics around the numbers and using that um, basically for, for basic facts, whereas numeracy is actually engaging that in real life and authentic experiences. When we think about critical literacy and critical numeracy, we want students to understand and to use mathematics for a purpose. There's not much purpose in just knowing our times tables, knowing that three times two is six. We want to be, uh, we want to be able to actually use that for a purpose. We're not interested in students who can just um, regurgitate facts um, because when we think about that as students in the, in the 21st century, a lot of those jobs that, that um, would be done will be done by a computer. If it's pure fact-based, a computer can be doing that. So what we want for our students is for them to be numerate. numerate. What does that mean? It means that they understand the maths, they you know when to use it and know how to use it. So when we're thinking about um, you know, getting our phone plan or it might be purchasing a car or going to the shops, or anything like that, that's using numeracy. And that's what we want our students to develop. So the first little activity I've got here is called one is a snail, 10 is a crab. I've got that on the screen, just so you can have a look at that title, jot it down if you like. It's by April and Jeff Sayre. I'm actually gonna read um, the first few pages to you. So just to get a hang of what this book is about. And then we'll talk about how we can use this book for mathematics. It's called one is a snail, 10 is a crab. And that's all about the idea that our number system is based on ones and tens. So when we're thinking about the number 22, generally speaking, it has two tens and two ones. We can trade and do that sort of thing with it as well. Uh, what mathematicians call petitioning. And that's what this book will help us with. So I'll just stop this presentation for a second. Put you back on this one. And this is the book here. So as I said, one is a snail, 10 is a crab. If you've seen it before, you can put a thumbs up just so I know. If you haven't seen it before, that's fine. We'll just read a few pages and get the hang of it. So it's, it's a counting by feet book, which means that it's looking at how many feet these animals have and thinking about um, using those numbers to do some activities. So they're off to the beach. And one is a snail. And it says under here, this is a snail's foot. So the snail has one foot. Who is a person? Now three can be a person and a snail. We can petition that number three and three can be made up of a two and a one. So again, for those junior school students, particularly students in, um, in year one, or, or even younger than that, maybe three or four or five year olds, this is a really powerful book. Or the next character we meet is a dog. 
wonder if any of you can guess what five might be. All the ones, the snails coming in use, use again. So five is a dog and a snail. Okay, so we've got that number five again made up of a four and a one. And so that use of petitioning is really powerful as they move through the school. When we think about doing even hard sums in mathematics when we're in year four, for example, and we get 64 divided by four, that question is quite hard unless we know that 64 can be made up of a 40 and a 24. And 40 can be divided by four 10 times and 24 can be divided by four as well. And we can get to the answer of 16. So the next character we meet is six, and this is an insect. Okay, and students at our school just sometimes call it bug. So six is an insect. I wonder if you know what seven might be. Here's our snail again. It's an insect and a snail. So again, it's a six and a one. So seven is made up of a six and a one. Eight is a spider. Visually nice and easy to see, so a four and a four. And then nine, again, that same sort of pattern is a spider and a snail. And 10 is a crab. And we can see that one. We actually count the crab's um, two front floors here, which means that all up it has 10 feet. And so with that book, what we want to be doing is we read that to students. We then might have what we, what we would call a number of the day. And we would say things like, I wonder if, um, if there's different ways that we can make six. And of course, the first thing students would say would be, oh, it's an insect. And then some students might realize that actually three people would make up the number six. Or we might have a dog and um, a dog and a person. We could have a dog and two snails. So if we go back to this PowerPoint again briefly. We can start to do questions like this. So if we look at this one and we get an open ended question, and these are something I want to talk a little bit to you about as well, because we could ask questions like under the fence, let's imagine we spotted 12 legs. What could they be? So this is the first activity I really want to share with you. These idea of these open questions, rather than asking a question in a maths classroom where there's only one answer, where a student might just give a question, the other student answers it, and the question's done. Um, if we've got a teacher who might say, for example, five times five, and one student just calls out 25, well, that's not helped anyone. That's, that's just one student has already known that, and then the student's done the maths and basically stolen the answer from everyone else. Whereas these open-ended questions, there's not one answer, there's multiple answers. So I wonder in the chat box if everyone, anyone would like to have a go with those characters that we had. So we had a snail, we had a person, we had a dog, we had an insect, we had a spider, and we had the crab. I wonder, what could we see if it had 12 legs? Yes, I can see some answers coming through, which is great. Three dogs, excellent. So we can actually start to think about math, um, multiplication there. So three times four. So we've got students who might only be five, six years old, um, but they're starting to, to understand that multiplicative thinking. So that three times four is 12. So that's a, that's a great answer there. Another powerful um, maths sort of pedagogical practice that we use at our school and that I've seen schools use is the best question of what if. So what if changes any maths question? So for example, instead of saying 12, we could just say, what if there was 16 legs? Or what if there was 20 legs? So anytime a student solves that first question, we're immediately ready. We don't have to have anything major up our sleeve. We just think of what if and come up with something different. So have a think about that. I encourage you to write those words down. What if? They're the two most powerful words in a maths classroom. Another example of that what if, we can put more parameters around it. So if we kept that idea of 12 legs, we could say, what if there was only three creatures? Or what if? they had four eyes or what if there would, you know, um, there was there was five animals or whatever it could be. What if there was, there was six animals? I wonder if that would be possible. So getting students to think about that. If, as we keep going with this open-ended idea, up the top there, 
is a closed question. And if you have a look at it, if we're thinking about averages in our classroom, working at the average of something or the mean, some curriculum call it. So we've got a closed question. This is the type of thing that we would ordinarily see in a maths textbook. And it might be something like the children in the Smith family are three, eight, nine, 10 and 15. What's their average age? And of course, then we work it out. We plus three plus eight plus nine plus 10 plus 15. We divide by five and we get the answer of nine. And again, it's one quick question. If a student knows how to do averages, it's very straightforward. They're following a process. They may not even understand averages, but they know that if we plus those together, divide by how many, we get the answer. A better version is these open questions. And it's an easy change for teachers to make. So rather than giving them the front information, we give them the end. So it gives them a sort of that open middle. So here we go. The qu open question could be, there are five children in a family. The average age is nine. How old might the children be? And so that's, that's a far harder question. I mean, for myself personally, I'm gonna need a pen and paper to try and work this out. I'm gonna have to be working around that average age of nine. I might have an eight and a 10 year old. That'd balance out to about nine as my first go. I could have a seven, so I could have an eight year old, a 10 year old, maybe a seven year old, and an 11 year old and a nine year old. And I know that'll give me an average of nine. Have a think about yourself in your own classroom. Are there questions that are currently closed? They're either questions from a worksheet, they're questions from a textbook, they're questions that you put up on the board each morning or each afternoon that at the moment have only one answer, but there's a way to make it just to change it a little bit. So there's multiple answers. So if we're gonna have a go at these ourselves. So here's one here. I've seen this in a textbook. Mrs. Fernley had 24 cakes. She shared them equally between six plates. So this is, this is a question on, on sharing, on division. So this is maybe a year three, maybe year four question. 24 cakes shared between six plates. How many cakes on each plate? Now it's 24 divided by six is four, okay? Is there anyone who would like to have a go in the chat box of turning that into an open question? So are we still sticking to sharing? We may even still be sticking to Mrs. Fernley. We may not be sticking to this idea of 24. But how can we change this word problem? So it goes from being just that answer of four to maybe having multiple answers. Let's give you some thinking time. Yes, I like it, Safa. So Mrs. Fernley might want some too. We could have that as part of the question. We could say something like, Mrs. Fernley bought some cakes. She shared them between her and some students. How many cakes did they get each? And again, so that question, it involves Mrs. Fernley. So that's a slight tweak there as well. But then we didn't say how many cakes and we also didn't say how many students. So again, I'll repeat the question. Perhaps it could be changed to Mrs. Fernley bought some cakes. So instead of saying 24, we say some. Mrs. Fernley bought some cakes. She shared them between some students or even herself and some students how many cakes on each plate. So a student who's just getting started could say, well, she bought seven cakes. Um, there were six students, so they had one on each cake. But it allows that flexibility for those students to work with numbers, maybe even working into, into tens of numbers, maybe even working into hundreds of numbers and working out, you know, oh, she had 240 cakes or she had 2,400 cakes or it could be 1,600 cakes or whatever it could be. So those open-ended questions um, a lot of research coming out about them. And in terms of students, just being able to get into the problem, have some access to it, and then develop their mathematical thinking as they go. Really powerful for students to work together on it as well. A resource that we use at our school are these little mini whiteboards. Um, 
So they're fantastic. Uh, we've noticed a real change in students who previously would have been uncertain about writing down the answers um, and seeing that as a, you know, a wrong answer. When it's here, they can have a go. If they don't like it, they just rub it out. Oh, I like this one, Alexander. I like that a lot. What will be the remaining cakes on each plate after Miss Sh Burnley bought 24 cakes and shared them on the six plates? That's very, that's very nice. I like that. I like that a lot. Okay, so the second one, again, this is going back, as I said, these are great activities. They're, they're easy. Uh, they're changes that teachers can make. This is another one with a lot of power and a lot of research around it. They're called number talks. As with the open-ended questions, which you can easily find on Google, number talks are the same. Pop on Google, have a look at those. And these are just some examples. So basically the idea of this is rather than the teacher being the font of all knowledge and the teacher sharing the exact answer with all the students, what we're wanting from a number talk is to value the different ways that students use uh, mental arithmetic. So we generally want these to be done in our head. We don't want uh, such an easy answer like tw uh, 20 take away 10 that the students just know it. We want something with some flexibility um, that lends itself to maybe something that you're working on in class. So for example, the year four example there, where it says four times 13, if you're working on doubling in your classroom, that's a great question because a student may say, well, I did 13 and I doubled it and then I doubled it again and I got 26 and then I got 52. So the answer to four times 13 must be 52. Uh, if you're working on tens and ones, that year one, uh, sorry, that year two question, 31 take 12. Feel free to have a go in the chat box. How would you solve 31 take 12? How would you solve it? So we're not as interested in the answer. We're interested in how the students and how the teachers also got to that answer. You can see from that little visual, my job is to show some wait time, value uh, all your strategies and just simply to be a recorder and a facilitator. Excellent, Safa, excellent. So you knew, you trusted that 31 take away 11 is 20. And because you know that 12, again, this gets back to that one as a snail book, uh, that 12 can be petitioned into an 11 and a one. You trusted that if you took off another one, you'd go from, you'd get to 20, you'd take off another one, you'd get back to 19. That's correct. So some students might even do um, 30 take away 12, and then put one back on. Some students might do 31, take one, take 10, take one and get to 19. So what we're doing with a number talk is just talking about numbers. Um, the best classrooms I've seen is, is, to, um, is where this is used basically every day in the, in the classroom. So we put up a question, it may only go for five minutes. Students get out their little mini whiteboard uh, they jot down and prove how they made it, how they did it, and, um, and then they show it to the classroom. The teacher can even do something called a rate the response, where we take the students' names off the whiteboard, bring the whiteboards up to the front of the room, and value and look at all of those different answers. And the idea, there's a lot of power in seeing that although we all had the answer of 19, we all had different ways of getting to it. That one's called a number talk. As I said, there's plenty of those on Google as well. Feel free to have a look or flick me an email and I can share some with you. This is another one, which is again, all over the internet, um, but again, lots of research behind it. And again, helps our students out with that disposition. What we're wanting from students, like I said, isn't just to get the answers right, although that's important. What we're after from students is that they're feeling confident with their answers, they're creative with their answers, and they're able to communicate their answers. So this one again is similar to open-ended in that there's no set answer. This one is just called which one doesn't belong. So we have a little quadrant like that and we have a six in this one, a 12, a 10 and a 15. And the question you ask to students is which one doesn't belong? So again, if you'd like in the chat box, feel free to have a go. Which one of those numbers is different? Okay, let's have a look, 10. Excellent. So yes, excellent, Sapphire. So might have different answers. 
odd even. Uh, someone said 10 is not divisible by three, what, by three, which leads me to check and want to know that, um, you know, some great discussions could be had with students to find out, well, are the other three divisible by three? Um, so that's a, that's a great one. We could say 10 because it's got no ones in the ones place. Um, there's a whole lot of answers that we could, we could look at with that. So again, that is called which one doesn't belong. Some students, sorry, some teachers have found that um, it can just be spelled like this. If you type that into Google, which one doesn't belong, W-O-D-B, you'll get some ideas there or um, for some ideas to share with your class. But again, you could do shapes, you could do, uh, you know, you could do fractions, you could do anything at all in those four, in those four boxes, and then have some good discussions in your classroom around why that number, why that student felt that that number didn't belong, that it was slightly different to the other. And in the end, I guess it's an inclusive um, activity because the answer is they all belong. They're all different. They're all the same. So again, this one is uh, called Would You Rather? So this one is a nice one. This one, again, just really great discussions that can be had with, in mathematics with this one. I've just chosen for this particular one some American money. And your job is basically as students in my class to find out which would you rather? Would you rather that uh, circle on the left or would you rather that circle on the right? And that's all you say to students and leave it up to them to think about what the question might be about. Some of them might notice that the, that the one on the left has a $10 bill, a $10 note. Some people might notice that there's more notes on the right. Um, so this is again, a fairly straightforward um, particular problem, this one. But this would you rather is really quite a powerful one, particularly when we think about mathematics and we're thinking about, you know, shopping and things like that, which is better value is another way that people put it. Um, but with this one here, I don't know if someone would like to have a go in the chat box as to whether they would rather the one on the left or the one on the right. And again, what we want is some proof. We want some student reasoning in this one. Although the answer is important, we want to find out how you knew that to be true. So feel free again to have a go in that chat box. This has been great so far. Yep, so they've got to add them up, Safa, exactly. Someone might want the right because they're all the ones. Some people might realize that if we add up those ones on the right, we've got, uh, you know, we might have to count them all up. We might find that there's 13 there when we look carefully. Okay, so that one's just called Would You Rather. Here's another one. And these ones are just called Mashup Maths. You may have seen these. Um, they were doing the round on the internet a little while back. But again, these ones do actually have a set answer. And this is sort of that early algebraic thinking for students. So we're just introducing it using a nice fun little visual. Uh, and students basically, the end result is we have to try and figure out how much would a blue jelly bean, pink jelly bean, and a green jelly bean be worth altogether. So again, we look, we look at this one carefully. We might have some good discussions. You might allow students to talk to their peer, to their, to their friend beside them. You might allow students to use their mini whiteboard. Um, initially, you might just let students do what we call a notice wonder. So they might just say, oh, I notice that the pink jelly bean and the pink jelly bean gives four altogether. Or I wonder which jelly bean might be worth more. Those sort of questions are really, are really powerful initially. And then as we go through, we might realize that if a pink jelly bean and a pink jelly bean is four, then maybe the pink jelly bean is two. And then we find out that a pink jelly bean and a green jelly bean on that next line there is, is eight. And students work out, again, getting back to that book about one is a snail with petitioning um, that leads into this algebraic thinking, we end up realizing that, that the green one must be six 
which helps us with that next line. Um, so that third line there says green plus blue equals nine. And then we wonder what that could be. And someone's got it in the chat box, which is great. So we think that the answer is 11. Um, are we all in agreement there? Put a thumb up if you, if you agree with that. We think we've got a two, a six, and a three. That sounds pretty good to me. All right, so those ones again are called mashup maths. There's some that are available free on the internet. You can make your own. There is a website, Mashup Math. Um, I'm not affili affiliated with that at all, but um, if you want to purchase off there, you can go to Mashup Maths. Our school has done so. Um, they're very reasonably priced at a digital booklets for that one. So feel free to have a look at that if you like. Next one. It's basically just to talk to students about the maths that we see in real life. We don't want students to think that maths is just something that we do in the classroom and then we go home and maths no longer exists. In actual fact, maths is everywhere. And the challenge for us as teachers is to get that real life math that happens at home and bring that into the classroom. So a really simple example that I've seen is, um, you know, when you go to a, a restaurant and you might see some pictures uh, of what they've got for sale, and so I just took some pictures of these. These are ones that I found on, off, um, on the computer. So we've got um, nuggets can be sold uh, as either nine, six or 20, which again, I mean, for me as a mathematics teacher, that just you know opens, uh, opens a lot of doors as to sort of the discussions you could have with students. Um, the way I would run this activity in my classroom is to just put the visual up on the board and do it a little bit like a number talk and get students to do that sort of notice wonder. So they might notice that the 20 is bigger than the six and the nine. So they might initially just realize that that's the biggest box. It's got the most nuggets. They might notice that the six um, nugget one is the, is the smallest number. And then students might start to wonder, oh, I wonder how many nuggets, you know, I wonder how much it costs, for example. And we could, we could look that up. We could find out how much they cost and work out which is better value and do things like that. Again, taking that real world and bringing it into the classroom. My head again goes to petitioning and looking at uh, what numbers we can make with the six, nine and 20. So for example, can we buy 15 nuggets? And students might realize, yeah, we can. We could get a nine and a six pack. Um, could we get, you know, 18 nuggets? Well, yeah, we could buy two sets of nine or we could get three of the six McNuggets. And so then we start to start to sort of work on that idea and think about all this all these numbers that we've got and how we could purchase them. What's the best value? So again, with this one, I'm not promoting McDonald's, um, but what I'm saying is to get these photos that you might see out and about. You might have your smartphone on you. You're in a restaurant, or you're going shopping, or you're buying something, or wherever it is. You're out in nature and you spot something and it looks like it might lend itself to some great maths discussions. Take a quick photo, bring it into your classroom, tell the kids the story. Say, hey, listen, on the weekend, I saw this. And to see where that discussion leads to you. As a mathematics teacher, this one actually in our classrooms that I've seen, it goes to the idea of a Frobenius number. Frobenius is spelled F-R-O-B-E-N-I-U-S, I believe, Frobenius. And basically, it's the, it's the largest number that you couldn't get. So, for example, can we buy uh, 42 nuggets? Can we buy 39 nuggets? Can we buy 51 nuggets? Can we buy? And so what the Frobenius number is and what students in my classes have enjoyed working out is what's a big number of nuggets that we that actually couldn't buy with these packs? Okay, I mean, we can, obviously can't buy seven nuggets. We obviously can't buy 11 nuggets. But is there a big number that we still can't buy even with these different options. Okay, so as I said, that's um, towards the end of this session, but before, um, before we wrap up and even take some questions at the end, these are some great questions that uh, have a lot of research about them that'll get that mathematical discussion having, happening in your classrooms. As mathematics teachers, we've generally been given a curriculum. We're generally fairly good at what we call explicit or direct teaching. Um, it may be through a textbook, it may be through the curriculum that our school has. What we also want to try and bring in, if that doesn't allow it, or doesn't have it at the moment, 
is that problem solving, that reasoning and that discussion. We want these students to be numerate, not just understand mathematics. I'll say it again, we want them to be numerate, not just understand mathematics. So we want those discussions and great questions, as I said from the top, that question, what if? What if it was this or what if it was that? Ask a student, can you prove your answer or can you prove your answer to your friend? What's the same about this? What's different? Does that always work? So if a student stumbles upon a formula, they think, oh, solved it. Well, ask another question. Does that formula always work? And then a really powerful one for students is as they walk out the door, ask them to articulate what it is they've actually learned today, not just what they've done today. So at the end of this presentation, if you like, send me an email and I'll forward you this presentation and also the handouts. Um, but if we move on, this is for the parents out there. So this is some advice from Dr. Jo Bowler. You can, you can look her up on the internet as well. She's done a lot of research uh, with a lady by the name of Carol Dweck, who pioneered that growth mindset work in classrooms and in society, I guess you could say. And so her advice, Jo Bowler's advice to parents is, number one, encourage the students to play puzzles and maths games. So again, I can't, I can't um, overestimate this one. It's, it's in underestimate rather, it's very important that students play board games, that they play games at home. Number two, always be encouraging and never tell, tell students, tell teachers, tell kids rather, that they're wrong when they're working on it. So rather than just saying, no, you're wrong, let them figure it out and then ask them, oh, did that work out? Number three, and this is what we're trying to negate at the moment, is never associate maths with speed. So it's not that we want the students to get the wrong answer. The right answer is important, but we want to make sure that it's not just speed that we're chasing. We want students to understand. Number four is an interesting one. It's a confusing one sometimes for parents that we work with, but there's a lot of research coming out that is parents, if we share with our students that we weren't good at maths at school, particularly for girls, if their mother shares that, it can almost give, give the girl that idea that, oh, okay, I wasn't good at, I'm not good at maths at school because mum wasn't good at maths. So because mum's not good at maths, I'm not good at maths. So it's kind of playing into that uh, space of, oh, you know, she, she doesn't have a maths brain or he doesn't have a maths brain, which is just totally incorrect. There's no such thing as a maths brain. Um, and we basically can all learn maths to a high level if we're given the right, the right capacity and the right structures. So these activities that I've shared as well today do that number five, they encourage that number sense. So it's not just about figuring out what the answer is. We're wanting students to work things out flexibly. And that final point there is a good one as well, that growth mindset. So that's what we're talking about with that fixed mindset versus the growth mindset. Growth mindset is that, you know, we're praising students and saying, um, not just that they're smart, they did well working on that problem or yeah, that was hard, but you'll get there. Well, that's wonderful. Your brain is growing as things are tough, not sort of like, oh, that's really hard. I can't do that. Well, you know, we, want, we don't want that. We want students to work on the challenge and see that as, as something to aspire to. So there's some lesson beliefs from me. I'll send you the PowerPoint. You can have a look at that um, down the track if you like. And this is an example week what your class could look like with the blue being what teachers generally do really well in my experience that sort of explicit teaching again like I said that might be out of a out of a booklet that might be out of a textbook that might be the curriculum given to them by their by their school their state or their nation but we've got in there some little other activities that we can sort of litter the week with and some of those ones I've shared with you today so little warm-up games what we call little activators these are um, Bit of materials that I have in my classroom. So, you know, counters, blocks, we've got playing cards, we've got dice. Um, and these little ones here are really handy. They're just like, you might sometimes have seen them in cutlery drawers. Um, and you might think, what's that got to do with, with maths? Uh, well, it's really powerful because we can actually have that between the desks if students are playing games together. We roll the dice onto this grip mat. One, it gives them a game zone. So rather than having dice flying all around the class and rolling all over the place, the dice must land on this field, on this mat. And two, it's nice and quiet. So when we're rolling, rolling dice, 
rather than having 25 dice banging around. It's nice and quiet. So I recommend you practice those. Um, so we've got some other ideas there through uh, that website, that I've sh that um, table that I've shared with you. And then finally, to wrap up, what's one action you could take from this PD? As we look back at those activities, are you going to incorporate more number talks? Are you going to talk incorporate um, more maths activators or little warm-ups with dice or playing cards? Are you going to think about these open-ended problems? Are you going to think about some more, um, you know, some little exit tickets or some real-life mathematics, bringing some photos that you've seen out when you've been out and about and bringing them into your, into your classroom? So that's how you can contact me. And um, I'll just close that one down. And that's what I had to share with you today. And I guess now it's time to um, take some questions from you, if that's okay. Or you can flick me your, um, your email address and I can send you the PowerPoint. And I'd like to thank you all for participating in today's session. I'll stop the recording, but I'm going to hang around for you.